Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Rhynchosaurs, meaning beaked lizards, were a group of unusual herbivorous quadrupedal archosauromorphs that lived during the Triassic period. They ranged in size from the 50 cm long Rhynchosaurus to the 2 m long Hyperodapodon, with the average length being 1 meter. Rhynchosaurs were a widespread and worldwide taxon, being found across all of the continent of Pangaea. Rhynchosaur fossils have been found in Britain, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Madagascar, India, Brazil, Argentina, Canada and the United States, although they are poorly represented in the Northern Hemisphere fossil record. In some fossil assemblages, several of these animals lived alongside one another, as evidenced by the four contemporaneous species in the Upper Triassic Santa Maria Formation of Brazil. Rhynchosaur fossils are very abundant in some assemblages, in some fossil localities accounting for 40 to 60% of all specimens found, and the anatomy and ontogeny of a few species is comparatively well known. Early primitive forms such as Mesosuchus and Hauesia were more typically lizard-like in build, and had skulls rather similar to the early diapsid Yunginia, except for the beak and a few other features. Since the first rhynchosaur, Rhynchosaurus articeps, was named in 1842 by Richard Owen, there has been debate as to where they belong on the reptile family tree. Owen initially described some rhynchosaur material as that of a labyrinthodont amphibian. He later realised this mistake and came to regard rhynchosaurs as being close relatives of dicynodonts, as the tusk-like caniniforms of the latter were wrongly thought to be homologous with the paired maxillary beaks of rhynchosaurs. A relationship with Sphenodon, the Tuatara, was also suggested, as the beak-like premaxillae of the Tuatara was, again, thought to be homologous with the beaks of rhynchosaurs. Thomas Huxley also supported an affinity between rhynchosaurs and Sphenodon when he described Hydrodapodon in 1869, and he proposed the name Sphenodontia for this group. While numerous different classification schemes were proposed during the course of the 20th century, it was mostly thought by the 1960s and 70s that the Tuatara and Rhynchosaurs were close relatives, that they formed a group termed Rhynchocephalia, and that Rhynchocephalia was a part of Lepidosauria, the group that also includes lizards and snakes. Numerous studies published since the 1980s have shown that Rhynchosaurs and the members of the Tuatara clade were not actually close relatives at all. Pedro Burkhardt in the year 1900 even argued that the supposedly similar premaxillary beaks were actually completely different. Tuatara and kin, now termed Sphenodontia, are lepidosaurs, and hence close to squamates, while rhynchosaurs are archosauromorphs. In terms of appearance, imagine a reptilian pig with a broad head, no visible ears, and a parrot-like beak and you have a pretty good mental picture of what a rhynchosaur looked like. Unlike other archosauromorphs covered on this channel so far, these animals were barrel-chested, short-necked and heavily built herbivores. The most distinctive rhynchosaur characteristics are found in the skull, and their teeth and jaws are unlike those seen in any other animal. Seen from above, the rhynchosaur skull is vaguely triangular, with a narrow snout and a broad posterior region. In later and more advanced genre, the skull is short, broad and triangular, becoming much wider than it is long in the most advanced forms, with a deep cheek region and the premaxilla extending outwards and downwards to form the upper beak. In the most derived taxa, like the Upper Triassic Hydrodapodon, the skull is nearly twice as wide as it is long. In these wide skulled forms, Gigantic fenestrae virtually meet along the midline of the jaw. This implies that rhynchosaurs had large jaw muscles and a powerful bite. The lower jaw was also deep, and when the mouth was closed it clamped firmly into the upper jaw, like the blade of a pen knife closing into its handle. This scissors-like action would have enabled rhynchosaurs to cut up tough plant material. The short-faced, wide-skulled appearance of rhynchosaurid rhynchosaurs was less developed in the basal taxa, such as Mesozoucus and Hauesia. These basal forms did possess all of the key rhynchosaur autopomorphies, but they had longer, narrower skulls, longer, slimmer legs, and much longer tails than more derived forms. 
Mesosuchus and Hawesia would have superficially resembled big lizards or tuataras in proportions and appearance. The large orbits of rhynchosaurs demonstrate large eyes and hence a good sense of sight. A large cavity within the nasal region suggests that the animals also had a good sense of smell. Rhynchosaurs had very odd teeth. Most reptiles have a single row of teeth in each jaw. They replace their teeth over and over again as they wear out, and the number of teeth in each jaw stays about the same over the animal's lifetime. None of these generalities applied to rhynchosaurs. They had many rows of small teeth closely packed together in the upper and lower jaws, like the kernels of a corn on the cob. These plate-like teeth formed surfaces for cutting and crushing plant material. This thick tooth socket attachment is unique to these animals. Also, rhynchosaurs did not shed their teeth like other reptiles. Once their teeth were worn away, food was cut and ground against the dense bones of the jaws themselves. Finally, rhynchosaurs are unusual among vertebrates in that the new teeth were added at the back of the jaws as long as the animal was growing. The blade-like upper beak was formed from an extension of the premaxilla and would have been useful in piercing tough plant matter, as well as potentially helping defend the animals from predators. The exact appearance of these beak teeth in life is debated among paleontologists. Often, reconstructions of rhynchosaurs depict them as lacking any form of lips, with the premaxilla protruding outward similar to the incisors of naked mole rats. There is a possibility, however, that, like some non-avian dinosaurs and lepidosaurs, these animals had fleshy lips that would have largely covered the upper beak, so as only the tip would have been visible in life. If so, rhynchosaurs would have strongly resembled thick-set, large-headed versions of the modern tuatara. The hind feet were equipped with massive claws, presumably for digging up roots and tubers by backward scratching of the hind limbs. The rhynchosaur humerus is short and stout, with large crests for muscle attachments and a wide, flaring distal end. The rest of the forelimb appears fairly typical for a diapsid reptile. Many sources state that the rhynchosaur hind limb appears well suited for scratch digging. This is where curved claws are used in a raking motion to shift sediment, but few elaborate on it. While illustrations usually depict rhynchosaurs as sluggish, ground-hugging animals with short, fully sprawling limbs, the details of their limb anatomy show that their limbs were semi-erect and that their bodies were typically held well up off the ground. In the shoulder girdle, the socket is located far away and faces backwards and sideways. These features and others indicate that a semi-erect forelimb gait could be adopted. In the hind limb, the hip socket is broad and shallow and faces downwards and backwards as well as sideways. Rhynchosaur hands and feet were not close together and directly underneath the body as they are in erect limb tetrapods, but they were closer together than those of truly sprawling lizards. Large attachment areas were available for well-developed flexors and extensors of the foot. This shows that the long, strongly clawed feet would have functioned well in digging. The foot claws of rhynchosaurids were not long and pointed, but very deep and narrow, and on digits that allowed a wide range of flexing and extension. It is inferred from these details that rhynchosaurs used their feet to break up and shift the ground sediment, perhaps while they were also foraging for roots, tubers and other plant structures. Longer, slimmer claws were present in Mesosuchus, so this basal animal may not have indulged in the same behaviour. The tusk-like premaxillae have been typically imagined as plant-gathering organs, and the powerful shearing jaws and occluding dentition look well suited for a tough diet of plants. Seed ferns, conifers, cycads, ginkgos and ferns have all been suggested as possible food items. Rhynchosaurs were limited to plants growing at or near ground level due to the fact that they could not climb. An alternative suggestion to herbivory is that rhynchosaurs ate bivalves. Some paleontologists have favoured this possibility, both because shells were common in rhynchosaur bearing sediments and because snails are sometimes eaten by living reptiles. However, Others have argued that the precision blade and groove rhynchosaur jaw morphology does not compare at all well with the jaw of cr extant shell-cracking animals. Furthermore, the unique teeth and jaws of rhynchosaurs were clearly specialised for shearing, not cracking. This theory is very unlikely in my opinion, 
and Ringasaur should best be interpreted as slow-moving, scratch-digging herbivores and low browsers, inhabiting a niche that was once taken by the small fossorial Dicynodonts in the Permian. Although this group of therapsids survived the end Permian mass extinction, the Triassic Dicynodonts tended to be larger herbivores that ranged from cow to elephant sized, and were one of the few large terrestrial non archosauromorph groups of the period. As the smaller forms had by and large disappeared, it seems that the Rhynchosaurs stepped into their vacated niche. In this respect, you can see where Richard Owen was coming from when he thought the two groups were close relatives. Like many animals of the time, they had a worldwide distribution, being found all across Pangaea. These abundant animals might have died out suddenly at the end of the Carnian, which was the middle of the late Triassic period, perhaps as a result of the extinction of the dichrodium fern flora on which they may have fed. On the other hand, Spielmann, Lucas and Hunt in a 2013 paper described three distal ends of humeri from the early mid-Norian Bull Canyon formation in New Mexico, which they interpreted as being bones of rhynchosaurs that belonged to the species Ochtichalia elderi. Thus, the fossils might indicate that rhynchosaurs survived until the Norian. Unfortunately, like many of the oddball archosauromorphs from the Triassic, rhynchosaurs did not make it into the Jurassic when the reign of the dinosaurs truly began. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be covering the Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey, a disturbing supernatural Bigfoot-like entity native to the Scottish Cairngorm Mountains. See you again soon. Cheerio.